You are all very welcome. And it is great that we gather to commemorate, remember, acknowledge what happened 150 years ago. So it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this gathering of dreamers as we acknowledge and celebrate the arrival of the first Christian brothers to Melbourne in 1868. It is a time to acknowledge and commemorate the arrival of Ambrose Tracy, Percy Bogdan, Barnabas Lynch and Joseph Nolan to Oceania. These men travelled across the seas to what was called the New World. Their feelings are really not known how they felt and how they travelled. However, they came prepared for teaching and establishing educational institutions for the marginalised of the time, mainly Irish immigrants. 150 years after their arrival, we gather here at the Tracy Centre in Melbourne to continue their original dream. It is an exciting time to be alive and is, as it is obvious to me that change is happening and this is change is happening on many fronts. There is no turning back. Hopefully as we gather today we engage with each other and contribute to the evolving reality of what it means to be part of the journey as the Edmund Rice vision takes on new expressions. You are certainly warmly welcomed to this site and to engage in this ongoing journey that we've started already. Like Ambrose and his community of brothers, we continue to interpret the spirit in our time and how we need to respond in a very different Australia from when the Donald Mackay arrived at Port Melbourne. I suppose just this next couple of minutes, the real importance with this is, and I, if I could start with just a simple old story. Um, when, when I was a much, much younger brother, uh, there were still big numbers joining at that time in the brothers, and so my group was about oh, 15 or so. And we regularly, maybe five, six times a year, used to gather in a Chinese restaurant for those who could. And we used to solve all the problems of, of the world uh, during the meal. But as one brother used to observe, but nobody kept any notes. You know? <laughs> and that was always the problem afterwards. So th this is to do with, could we keep some notes from this gathering? It's really important, yeah? So we really, everybody, whenever we met, at the committee planning said, please let's not kill each other with group feedback, because everybody looks at pain look on their face the moment you talk about it as a process. So we've tried to say, look at a whole lot of different ways that people could give us information back. Sometimes we'll do what we're doing this morning, we'll just take a group read of the group instantly, just words, and if people have got something they'd like to offer, that would be really helpful to us. It's not just your information, it's a sense of where the group's going. Yeah, that, that's really helpful to us. Then there's a board just here, the blackboard that you can see just here, and alongside it there are some sticky notes and, and a few texters. If you've got some feedback, or it could be an affirmation, confirmation, question, that you'd like to just stick there as, as a contribution to the group process. So I'm really not interested in, in your own personal questions, like you know where your life's going or anything like that, but about us and the process, anything there at all. There's a, uh, a Twitter feed running for those who, who do the technology Twitter <coughs> thing. So once again, uh, confirmation, affirmation, question, uh, idea to share, easy done. Joe will say a bit more about that in a moment. Yeah. Um, so there's that board, there's the Twitter feed, and then there's Debbie and I that you could directly give us a sense uh, of, of something that, that's sitting with you. And it's really important, I, I won't do this to you, but with other groups, I've sometimes started by asking uh, the group, 
I learned they got burnt a few times asking, did anyone have a dream during the night last night that was for our conference? Um, it's always a dangerous area, but, but it is true that organically a group, people are receiving a sense or a, a, a read on where the group's going or what's happening, yeah? So if you can give us some of that, it may not be clear to you, but you saying, oh, I'm getting a feeling it's about this sort of stuff, that may make a lot of sense to us because we're hearing it in six other places. Yeah? So please don't, whatever it is that's with you, if you've got a sense that this could be a contribution, we'd really ask you to make it so that we, we've got that to carry forward. Um, I'm Danny Moore um, from Ballarat, a teacher at St Patrick's College. We've just had a, a great beginning to the gathering, um, very colourful, uh, engaging uh, gathering and great sharing amongst the people. And there's a really great and positive vibe amongst those who gather. I'd like to begin with a, a verse by an Australian poet, Noel Davis. I think it captures what we are trying to do. Accompanying each other, caring for each other, doing things together. <coughs> Taking each other beyond what we alone see to places we have never been. Finding our way through the impulses, growing in trust and self-confidence, and the audacity to explore another way, bring into the light our unlived selves. Grow us into the fullness of ourselves and expand the frontiers of our freedom to choose. The energy is contagious and vibrant. We've been engaged in small group conversations this morning that we're self-organizing around some important themes and questions that are important to the participants. And from what I can tell, the groups have been dynamic, energizing, raising important questions. This afternoon, we'll hear from these groups to see where the energy was and what that might mean for us as we think about tomorrow and then the ongoing work of sustaining the work of the movement. Hi, I'm Nick, uh, the Executive Officer for Edna Rice Camps in Brisbane, Queensland, and uh, we're at the uh, Tracy Celebration today. Uh, where what I've really got out of um, the last two days so far is the the energy, enthusiasm uh, from the brothers, uh, all the people that have been before us to have that trust and, and commitment to continue the movement, and uh, where that trust to allow other people into the fray, so or in from the fray. Um, and to carry that forward, so really guiding us to be able to do that. Charism is a living passion for whatever dimension of the life of Christ is missing now, here, at this time, where we are. It's a living passion for that dimension of the life of Christ that is invisible in our world now. The truth is, since charisms are the saving mysteries of the life of Christ for the church, they never die. The problem is, they can die in us. They can die in us if we refuse them. They can die in us if we rigidify them, put structures around them. And they can die in us if we fail to give them away. But the key elements of the Emmaus story, we tell the story. We tell the story to one another. So we need to listen and we need to unpack what happens in that story. And as we go along and we hear the truth of the story and we unpack the truth of the story, we're invited in to share bread and wine. And somewhere in that sharing the bread and wine, we get an insight into the mystery of what it is to be in communion with one another. And what did we say at the end? What, what was said at the end? Did not our hearts burn? So hopefully, as we come tonight into that place, we invite, we, we touch into that place where our hearts have been burning in the last few days and we're able to share that. So as we share that tonight, I invite you to try and pick up all those bits and pieces and enjoy the evening.
and we enjoy the ritual. wonderful end to our time together. We, uh, Shane asked me at lunch if we needed to make some handouts for of, of these questions. And then what we decided, instead of, again, using more paper, that um, if each person from whatever group you're going to be a part of, if one person could just take a picture on your phone, then that way you got the questions. So here's what we invite you to do. And you know, I, I gave you a hint of this before lunch. We want you to just form small groups, eight or 10, um, and to be very intentional about who you connect with. So, you know, it'll be self-organizing. Look around the room and, and just find seven or eight others, no more than 10, because then it would take us too long, seven or eight no more than 10, to just go find a quiet place in the arbor, the rose garden, the end of this room, the, all the breakout rooms are open and the chairs are still set up. And your first task as a group would be to say, you know, which one or two of these questions are burning in our heart? Not every question will speak to you, but perhaps one or two will be one that you say, you know, I really do want to answer this. This is the one that's important to us, to me. And just explore together your responses to these questions. They've been, they're questions that have been in the room since Thursday, really. How do we sustain, nourish, continue? What do we need? How do we connect? What's my level of commitment? So if you self-organize, get into groups of eight or nine, find a quiet, a quiet space, and just together um, answer one or two of these questions so that when we come back, we can begin to get a sense of the collective, well, here's what we need. Um, or here's how I understand the relationship between the existing ministries and the movement. Or here's what I think the movement gives the world. This is why I want to commit to it and be a part of it. Here's how I see the brothers. Whatever question speaks to you, and if the, there's a question that's burning in your heart that's not there, trust that's an important question. All right? So my first task is just to make sure that you're clear of your task. Is everybody clear? Okay. <laughs> Have you noticed? You didn't need a bell. Right? You didn't need a bell. Just all reconvened <coughs> the right times. I should have told you this before, but I forgot. But here's what I think would be important for us this afternoon. I do think it's important to hear from each group. And I didn't tell you that ahead of time, but you're smart people. You'll figure that out. And so if someone from your group speaks, then they've spoken for your group. <laughs> And you'll recognize that person of, oh, okay, she's speaking for us or he's speaking for us. Now, if there's something that they didn't say that's important for the group's voice to be heard, then it's perfectly okay to say and, but let's not hear eight voices from every group. Right? The other thing is that if there is something that emerged from your group that is really important to document, to write down, then please do that. Give it to me, to Graham, put it on the table. We'll make sure that that gets to the steering committee and they'll make sure it it, it has a home and has a way um, to be responded to or to be noted, all right? So what did you say? What questions did you answer? What came out of your conversations? They were questions about what do you need? How are you understanding? What would be important to do if you had a magic wand? Those were the, that was the essence of those questions. So let's hear from the groups. What did you notice? What's important to raise up for us all to hear? Because these are collective questions. 
and we've got two mics. And if, if the mic doesn't work where you are, just move around and find the sweet spot in the room where it will work for you. Yep. Well, in our group, we uh, talk about many things. We have group of eight. We were seven Christian brothers and uh, and uh, uh, one lay woman and <laughs> and uh, one lay man. So there we are. So the most important thing for me listening to it was listening to John Wright and uh, the whole issue of prison ministry and uh, the, uh, the issue of uh, what um, Edmund Hughes took in, in, in companioning condemned people. Uh, like this, you could say, uh, Edmund, in the icon there, is companioning people to the ghetto. But really, they're, they're prisoners, the people in prison now, some of them are there for life, right? for a whole a lot of reasons. So that surfaced for me, and um, maybe for our group, huh? the importance of prison ministry huh? has really been uh, of the essence of Christian brother Edmund Rice ministry. <coughs> Our group looked at uh, sustaining and growing the organisation. I suppose you could say structurally, avoid that if you wanted to. We really did a, an organisation which will give some patronage service as ERA gave to the formation of Edmund Rice Education Beyond Borders. Somebody has to prepare some emails and do things. Anyway, what we thought had to happen, or could as well happen, is <coughs> invitations. And there could be advocates in each state who might arrange to get five minutes at school staff meetings, at workplace meetings, whereby they could just say that such a movement exists an invitation to join and maybe deliver just a little bit of paper with a website or for them to put down their email so that they could get, say, a newsletter which might come out every two months to give everybody around Australia and beyond involved. Now already there's a province newsletters, there's uh, board reports and there's from, from all of our kindred organisations now, with a little bit of good editing, they could be brought down to simple, succinct paragraphs, which would be of interest to the whole, um, the whole group. And there are other groups that meet from time to time, like the ERA College Captains from around Australia, to get 15 minutes there to tell of such a thing. There are people who come back from immersions who like to know, what more can I do? There are some of the things we had. We did give a little brief moment to what does this movement give to the world? And we came up with a sense of belonging with an underlying spirituality. So what I heard in that group was a way in which to name and invite others into this movement so that it, it has a sense of we exist and you're invited into this if it's something that you find would give your sense of belonging, meaning, purpose, contribution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, over here. In, in our group, we uh, really got into a discussion initially about New Zealand and the unique situation there with, with the fairly fragile realities um, of numbers of people involved in things, but at the same time very creative things. Uh, I think our discussion might have moved into an awareness that as we think about possibilities for the future, the groups that are more out on the fringes geographically might need more attention and support rather than less, as often happens, when the, the bigger uh, geographic centres seem to be able to 
find ways of doing things and unless something is really in our minds, the outer places can be sort of left to themselves somewhat and that may not be a, a wise way to do it. See, and that would be the important part of the capacity to see beyond what is, to see out where there may be these sparks, right? These small little local sparks that might need um, just a little nourishment or encouragement. How's it going? What do you need? Is there something we can do to support what you're doing locally? Right, where it's just a little bit of attention, a little bit of loving gaze to help those on the periphery continue to exist and perhaps to grow. Not to dominate, but to notice, to <coughs> nourish. Mm -hmm. um, just to um, follow on um, from Peter, I was in that same group. Um, being the New Zealander, and um, that becomes apparent as I speak longer. You're um, <laughs> <laughs> everyone. Uh, I, I just want to say that, that what Peter said was true, and, and the opposite, um, that sometimes when you continually work uh, frugally, and mainly with volunteers, uh, where there's very few paid employees, uh, there's something to offer other organisations as well about how you come together and work frugally and amazing things happen when people come together. We're nothing on our own. Our strategic relations, uh, relationships locally become really important too so that we're being um, uh, energised uh, or sharing our, our vision with other like-spirited like -spirited organisations um, to follow on from the discussion around uh, Eden Rice in the prison, uh, the Eden Rice Justice Trust offers uh, restorative justice conferences for high-end post-sentence offenders. We're talking about murder, we're talking about rape, we're talking about arson, we're talking about some heinous crimes, working quietly away. Uh, it's actually easier to get out of prison than it is to get in. So the fact that in God's southernmost outposts down there in, in Christchurch, or one of the <coughs> southernmost outposts, we, there is a presence, and it, it is a presence in relationship with two or three <coughs> other small organisations who are not even rice, but we have a, a shared vision. That shared vision is incredibly important uh, for sustainability in the context of our own culture, and the context of our own time and place. So um, I think that though we mustn't lose sight of those relationships. Kathy, that's very important because you, could be in that, and I'm going to use for lack of a better word at this point, collaboration or network locally that's looking at restorative justice. Not everybody connected to you that's doing that good work may identify themselves with the movement, but you do, right? So you are part of it. You know what it means to you and what Edmund Rice would do if he were in New Zealand facing the suffering that, that you see, so that you can create this little hub over here of restorative justice. You're not trying to recruit everybody else into the movement, but the movement is enriched by what's happening there. That's how we change the world. There's no card-carrying membership that has to happen among that collective in New Zealand. You bring that story back about how that works for you, and that might happen someplace else in the world. That's exactly the fluidity and the dynamism that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Let's get you. Let's get you the mic so we can hear. So, two weeks ago, um, if we believe in that beautiful theory that the, the wings of the butterfly are going to affect change, and, and you know, in a cosmic way somewhere on the other side of the world. Then two weeks ago, uh, a, 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 a very courageous daughter met with her father uh, who had sexually abused her and her sister 10 years ago and she courageously walked to a prison to meet her father for the first time. And something, she wanted to see how he was handling this. 
if we <coughs> can't feel something of a positive effect of uh, a young woman in this instance and the courage of the father too to meet the daughter, if that doesn't do something in our hearts and change something about what many people would say is impossible, is actually possible in the world, then we've lost the plot. So these stories energise me incredibly and they give me hope and some of the prophets that we uh, that are my prophets in my world are not known in the world. They are invisible, but they are very courageous and they represent many people around our planet right now. So, um, so human rights, presence, and the founding story, the gospel story, other faith stories, there are people um, whose stories resonate with us and still keep happening in the world. A few of us uh, who work in Tasmania got together to try and see what it might mean for us. We looked at the question, what does Edmund Rice give the world of the Edmund Rice movement? Um, if you ask people in Tasmania, if I say I'm from Edmund Rice, they'll say, oh, Edmund Rice does great things with young people and uh, they're impressed with how we galvanise volunteers. That's good. Um, I would say we also give the, I also know we do something with people on the edge or with justice. Um, I would say we also give a bit of the gospel, an insight into the gospel now, which has a good name, just that all the time. But um, the Edmund Rice story and it being um, a way into the gospel. We also have some unintended effects, um, as well as our Edmund Rice Associated Schools. Um, we get kids from Scotch College and Hutchins coming along, and I know it happens here in Melbourne with the tutoring programs and organs and so on. And with people like Brendan Douglas who go to another school, and then all of a sudden the grammar school is doing um, immersions to, we thought we had a mortgage on those. <laughs> and uh, we noticed that people, after camps, for example, start to move into teaching, youth work, social work, want to go on an immersion. Uh, one fellow I wanted to hear in Melbourne and went and learned Arabic because he was working with um, Sudanese and others and unintended consequences happened. We tried to say how do we understand the movement and then eventually said don't spend energy on who's in and who's out. And then we um, tried to look at what we might need to do in Tasmania and came up with a few areas we needed to look at. Uh, we thought we'd have another, another crack at conversation circles. Peter Hay has just breathed a big sigh of relief. Um, we thought we'd try and do something with the Catholic Youth Festival coming up in um, a, few, a week or so, two weeks. Uh, our Archbishop is keen for his uh, view of evangelization to be presented, so we'll complement that with other insights into the gospel. <laughs> <laughs> was no edge to that. <laughs> Targeting some key school leavers or people who have been in camps and have gone on to do other things but are still keen. Uh, one, we thought it was a, a bright young um, woman who does computer gaming and so on and ran a gaming oriented camp. And she dropped off the radar. Let's contact her because we know she's keen. And we're going to try and review our linkages with schools. Um, People in, uh, on site in our office in Hobart might be good for us to get together and reflect on the stories instead of telling them to everybody else, tell them to ourselves first. That's enough. Did you notice that in that answer, it was what they will do? We will. This and this and this and this and this. So we've had some mention of women today, or two very powerful women just shut me and said, get up and say something. Well, then mind them, right? <laughs> but uh, there was mention uh, before lunch about an elephant in the room. Well, we wanted to, well, we spoke about an elephant that's barely in the room because uh, we focused on some questions what this movement can do to change the world. And um, when we looked at those three things up there earlier about act locally, connect regionally, and learn globally, we're focusing in our conversation on learning globally mm -hmm. for the world. And I'm going to speak for the third world because there's a significant part of this province that is in the third world and um, it's barely been in the room over these three days. I sat down there earlier, casting my eye across all the brothers who are here um, who have had ministry and living outside of this nation. 
Now, I live on an island in the South Pacific called New Britain, and a number of you wouldn't have a clue where that is. Now, it's one of the New Guinea Islands, and I've worked at a place called the Urban Rights Life Training Centre. But I just made up this list, apart from me and Team G's, Tony Hamilton, Jeff Whitepool's just moved there, Bernie Garden, and Trevor Gibbons and Tina Hardy have all been there. Currently in the Philippines is John Moody and Ian Robinson, Luke and Peter Thrupp have also been there. Richard uh, Walsh has been in East Timor. A huge African, East African effort is currently Tom Carney, Peter Cole, God rest his soul, Peter Russell, Gerald Will, Bill Down, Laurie Collins, Sean McManus, Jared Benton, Maloney, Jared Bray, Paul Collins, Frank Perkins, Dominica, Hugh O'Neill, Latin America, John Casey, India, Philip Pinto, and excuse me, brothers, if I've left you out. But there's a huge part of the story of the brothers in this province that needs to be a part of the story of whatever emerges here. A huge part. So as we were considering this, the instinct was, oh, what can we do to help you? What can we send you? Blah, blah, blah. And I said, no, just back off from that. I don't think that's the right approach just yet. But at the same time, if the movement starts, especially with young people, they need to have something to do. Along with this is the emergence into the near future of Edmund Rice Ministries Oceania, an organisation will be launched July 1. So we've got ERA, we've got Edmund Rice Foundation Australia, and now this other one, it's like the Trinity. So the relationships that will exist between those three, I think has to be part of the conversation as this moves forward, and that this thing is not a separate, separate entity to all that, it's got to be in that Trinitarian structure that's there, and I, we suspect that somehow this thing needs some structure, and whether it fits in under the umbrella of BRMO in the future is a question to be considered. So we sort of went down that path, you know, what can this movement offer to the world, particularly the third world, the developing world? Um, what can you learn globally from the resource of the brothers? who are here about the developing world and uh, how can we take that forward. about creating the bandwidth that's what she's talking about the bandwidth that allows connections communication the capacity to connect um, there's ways in which you connect digitally there's ways that you can connect in place so this is the in place kind of thing which is cannot be substituted but doesn't have to happen 
the uh, this is not the only way to connect. There's other ways then digitally to connect that are real ways. I mean, for example, this whole committee that I worked with, I never met them once. So it's it's possible. Other other groups that are would be important to share. Yes. <coughs> I was, I was really waiting for Ani, but I, I think she can't be here at the moment. Right? She's coming. Ani! Oh, she's laughing. <laughs> well, I was waiting for you, so you couldn't. <laughs> um, the big words in our group were nourish and connect. And, and the second big conversation was that at this meeting there has been a, a shift. And the shift is where, where we are all Edmund Rice. That's, that's the first thing. And we come from different places and different histories. And, and the brothers, obviously, the foundation, and in some ways at the centre, but they're not at the centre of the movement. We're, we're all, if you like, somewhere on a circumference around the heart, which might be Edmund Rice or Jesus. Or, um, and so in that nourishing and connecting, I, I like, I think others like this idea you gave of just a robust and resilient core, which is we, we need some sort of structure to carry us, but if we can find a way that's going to work for everyone, which may involve the brothers continuing so generously to give up their power and their resources for a shared leadership that reflects the nature of the ministry. And uh, there's a definite call to the edges where, where there is life and less resourcing and, and how we do those kinds of things. So it's related a bit to Irma, um, but related a bit to all our responsibilities. So it was a terrific discussion. Sorry, on. I'm sure she'll find her voice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> This is rich, yes. Is it Dominic? Mark, Mark. Something I realised out of my group is um, that uh, within ministries, the leadership is, is few and spread across Australia. And from my probably personal experience, that can be quite vulnerable. And... Um, what I've learned about out of my group is that two guys from EREA, as they spoke about the vulnerability of Edmund Rice movement going forward, they could have been speaking of Edmund Rice Ministries as well. So I guess my encouragement to the group and something I'm conscious of is that ministries and EREA can work hand in hand around this forward and I look forward to that, and I especially, I guess, coming from as a leader within the Edmund Rice Ministries, would value that sense of collaboration at a, at a strength. Yeah. I think this should work for you. Oh, okay. he's going to get yeah. Thank you. Um, pretty much everything we discussed has been <coughs> raised. I think there's. Um, we have much in common here across this whole group. We, we focused um, <coughs> quite a lot on the type of uh, our own personal formation and nourishment that is needed. We can, I think services can come and go. They might last 100 years, five years, five minutes. But if it's a movement, we need to continually develop our spirituality. And we, we finished our, our discussion looking at, considering that we've got, as, uh, to do that, we've got a 150 years, really, of wisdom. And it's about the letting go <coughs> of that story and realising that every single one of us in this room and in our services is part of that story and how we keep one another going and um, the importance of sharing that. And we, we saw it all as getting back again to the root of the root of the root. And it's a way of expressing our Christianity, which might have more meaning for us.
Good enough? Whoops, I lost mine. There, no. Nope. Good enough? Yep. Yeah. Wow, that, that was clear, right? Yep. Ready for afternoon tea? You thought I'd never ask. <laughs> Let's take 30 minutes afternoon tea. And, yep, we'll come back and we'll finish up our time with everyone. Yeah, this has been, for those of you, we, this is the um, truth in lending, you know, the ingredients on the side of the cereal box. Um, we knew, and I think we said this this morning, we knew what we were basically thinking we needed to have happen on Thursday morning and Thursday and Friday morning. And then after that, it was organic and emergent. We, we had to respond to what the group said and where the group was and what the spirit was saying to really design then the next step. So we have been making the path by walking, um, and we got to about afternoon tea on Saturday, and we didn't know much more than that. So, but we, we convinced and we know what we're going to do. What we think is helpful would be for this, at, for closing this afternoon, is just to reflect back for, to you what we've noticed, what we're seeing from our vantage point, our stake in this is very different than yours. And so we're going to have a perspective that is just a different perspective. And so Graham is going to start, and then I'm going to conclude. And by that time, it will be 4 o'clock, and we will put a comma on the afternoon, and then let the rest of the evening unfold for us. So Graham. Uh, my bit is just to do with the, the tulips thing, which I think is a, is a quite insightful thing about how life acts. Um, and so I suppose my sense when Debbie and I were, were talking of, of what is it that we could take the group towards that will somehow help inform them going forward, for me it was uh, a memory of, of what was happening when you laid out, the two loops was laid out on the floor. Uh, I believe that what was there in you is a key way of how you go forward. And the second thing would be to make an observation about the, the difficulty of being in four different points of view uh, when we're on the two loops thing. So if I go to the first one. The first one for me is, is the key thing for this and any emerging system in my belief in going forward is what, what would happen when we laid it out. So when, when it was first laid out on the floor and people were asked to take up the four positions and peop, some people felt they were in a number and I, I saw that reflected in the reporting back this afternoon. Um, what struck me is there was a very respectful honouring of the fact that people found themselves in four places and that in honoring that person i was honoring that their role is necessary for this system to move through what it's living through in order to be the future it wasn't that okay how do we get all the hospices over to be trailblazers or how do we get all the trailblazers in to protect it's not that at all and there was another really honouring thing of people saying, well, I find myself called to serve here, but my heart's there. And I think that's incredibly true of a system as it's trying to be. So I suppose I, I would just want to speak for, when people say, well, what do we do now? And, and often we, we go towards uh, things that will, I think, fix the thing. I... One of the things that's always struck me about the universe thing, that, and I, I don't hold it necessarily as one story or another, I'm just amazed by what it is and how, how it works. And it has always struck me as a gift to us of how life actually goes forward. The fact that in the way that we tell the Christian story of the universe, that this being that called things into beingness did it with an absolute sense of trust and that in actual fact what allowed life to go forward was laid down in the flow of the relationships it was never laid down in the you will go here that the universe doesn't work on a set of 
rules in the sense of the way we often think, but in this whole process of relationship. And so for me, I would just encourage a deep sense of trust in the group, in each other, in each other's role in taking this forward. And that comes to the difficult side of being in a group. What struck me as I listened to the reporting back is I could hear people talking about the movement from a hospicing point of view, from a protector point of view, from a trailblazer point of view, uh, and from a <laughs> eliminator point of view. And sadly, it's one of the troubles of language. So I stand up and I say the word movement, but I don't have a label on me that tells you which part of the loop I'm talking about the movement from, which would help you understand where my passion and energy comes from in the emerging system. Does that make sense? It's, and that, that's, that's a big thing, you see, because if someone turns up and I'm a trailblazer type, I actually have trouble at times, if I speak for myself, with the hospicing energy. But I don't, I don't want to indicate I have trouble with hospicing people. It's just my nature suits me to a trailblazing space at times. And so learning somehow as a group to honour we're all necessary to the future. I need the hospicing people to do everything with all the best of their authentic energy and I want them to receive a message from me that says I trust you and applaud you and honour what you're doing. And I hope for the same where I find myself on the loop. That, that seems to me to be a really crucial part of this, that we can trust and encourage each other in whatever role. Because I believe each of the people, wherever they are, their good energy is what's <coughs> allowing us to live into the future. It's not the trailblazers or, or the other. It's us as a system or a group or a communion in the way we often say. So I'm not sure that that's the best I can offer. A real call to really trusting and honouring each other in the goodness and an appreciation that when we do group we often say the same words but we see them from quite different places. Yeah. Thank you, Graham. And, and what I loved as we heard the feedback is that you could hear the diversity of the ecosystem. Right, the ecosystem. And what I also love is that clearly you have established such a deep sense of trust and love for one another that you can hold all the diversity that exists in the body, lovingly, gently. And sometimes we annoy one another, well, welcome to the human family, all right? But at the end of the day, we love one another. We step back and we say it takes each and every one of us to play our authentic role and live out our individual story as we collect, connect with the collective story. So the other thing that occurred to me, and we heard it several times when folks said, well, it feels like we're in chaos. We're living in chaos. And if we don't name that for ourselves, we may not be naming the truth. And so I just sort of opened up the book. And this is the book I've been talking to you about. And I'll, I will um, give you the link to it. But it's called um, Harnessing the Power of Networks for Social Impact, Connecting to Change the World. Um, and really, we could just substitute the word movement here for all practical purposes in light, of, in light of what you're doing. And I just flipped it open to a page in the book, and this is what popped up, and I think it was the universe saying this would be important to say. And it was a leader of a very powerful movement. And the movement had been around for about 10 years. And they were interviewing this leader, and here's what she said. It managed chaos. She said, at the same moment, at the very same moment, this movement may seem both fragile and robust. I think it was in the very same moment, this movement will feel both fragile and robust. Now there's a paradox for you. Ready to fall apart and to take off. And we've heard that. We've heard that dilemma. 
This uncertainty keeps movement builders on their toes. We call it, the condition is what scientists of complexity call an edge of chaos phenomenon. Movements like other complex, self-organizing systems continually balance and rebalance themselves between order and chaos. In the case of a radically decentralized system, notice that word, a movement is a decentralized in the case of a radically decentralized system, chaos is what happens when individual members exercise their autonomy and each goes off in different directions. And order is established when members engage in collective action and come to share an identity. While some organizations tend to strongly favor order, and regard chaos as a crisis to be avoided, movements have to respect and maintain member autonomy and the chaos it may bring. Members have to find their own reasons to choose to work with other members. Instead of squelching chaos, movement builders have to recognize it as a source of movement vitality. Out of the chaos comes order, but the order is not permanent. Collective actions end, shared identities may fade, what members value may change, and new members may join the movement. And when the order erodes, it's out of the chaos of autonomous members that new order will emerge. So it's fragile, it's robust, there's autonomy, their structure, it's just managing that tender balance between all of that to hold the tension so that you can continue to move and be the Edmund Rice story in the world as it's going to take its many different shapes and iterations and forms. So I think that the chaos and the order and that tension between is something that you will continue to struggle with, balance, and be at home with. So I think that's all the work that is humanly possible out of this robust group of people that have called themselves together these three days. And Hugh, we know, spoke last night, and, and the team have given their, I can't see how they could have done anything more for Oceania in the last two months, and particularly in the last three days. So I'd ask if Hugh, Peter, Julian, and John could stand, and we give the apology for Richard, who's already started his journey back to Rome. So we just thank you. So we start our ritual this evening, and you'll find there's a little booklet in front of you, there's a glass of wine in the centre of the table and, a big, and some bread. And I'm going to ask Sheena and Kathy to lead us in this ritual tonight of Thanksgiving. Uh, tonight this is our table prayer for the breaking of bread and the sharing of wine. Uh, John Philip Newell writes, we need to find ways of sharing our intimate experiences of the mystery, for we are one. It is through one another that we will know more of the life that flows within us all. It is through sharing our fragments of insight that we will come to a fuller picture of the one who is at the heart of each life. This we have done over the past three days. May we bring all that has been and the hope for all that is to come to the sharing in this meal, where we continue the breaking of the bread and the pouring of the wine of our lives.
he saw God in everything and in everyone. And when we look at Edmund's charism, it's described as deeply aware of the Father's providential presence in his life. Edmund saw God in everything. Edmund reacted to his experience of God. We talk about the new consciousness and we struggle for a language. We can't talk about God. Young people and many people are upset with the church. So we can't talk about God. We can't talk about Jesus. that we need a language that we can use to talk about what it is that's deep within us. Because that's where the passion comes from. 